Welcome everyone to this President's Medal session. We'll be starting in a minute or so. Just let a few more people uh, come on in. My name's Gavin Blackett. I'm the Executive Director of the Operational Research Society. And my role today is to chair this session. I'll be making sure the uh, three presentations run to time. Uh, so let me first run through some very brief housekeeping rules. Um, I'm sure if you've attended one of the sessions before, you've seen them already. It's probably best if you position the speaker uh, in the top right-hand corner of your screen so you can see slides uh, to the best ability. Um, use the chat function to send us messages rather than raising your hand. There is a Q&A function available for your questions. However, we may not have time for them. Priority is given to the judging panel um, for the question and question answers before we could go to the audience. So we may not get opportunity to do that. Um, we've got a poll at the end of the session for you, the audience, to give us your um, impression of which was the best presentation. Um, that result will not be shared with you but will be shared with the judging panel and may be used as part of their criteria. Um, all the videos for all of the sessions of the conference will be available after the conference and we'll let you know as soon as they are ready. So we've got three presentations as part of this session today. They're listed for you on the screen. Each will be given a strict 20 minute uh, slot. I will be doing the timing and I will be providing audible clues uh, to the progress and I will cut them off after 20 minutes. After each there'll be five minutes uh, for the judging panel as I mentioned and there you can see the names of the three judges. Uh, I've mentioned the voting at the end and just so that you understand what the judges are looking for there are some judging criteria at the bottom. That's the level of demonstrable benefit the intellectual and novel content of the solution, the likely longevity of the solutions, and the excellence of the OR process. Uh, so that's me finished for the moment. You'll just hear me uh, at, with the time warnings um, and uh, guiding the judges through their questions. Uh, so sit back and enjoy the, the, uh, the, the session. Uh, so first up is uh, uh, Nav and John, so I'll hand over them to start their session. Um, so good morning to you all. Uh, so uh, we are presenting our work which has been developed by the University of Exeter Business School and uh, it's been over three years that we have been doing this work together with our partners, uh, the different NHS uh, trusts. So I will be starting the presentations and will be doing majority of these slides and then uh, John will be taking over and he'll be guiding us uh, through the question and answer uh, session and bringing me in wherever appropriate. I'll start with the concept, with the context. Uh, we know that, uh, you know, uh, if a person needs urgent and uh, emergency care, so we are talking in terms of loss of consciousness, chest pain, severe bleeding, then uh, they need to be at the a &E, uh, department. Uh, but also there are several other cases where you need urgent care, such as uh, cuts and burns, uh, uh, broken bones, and other, uh, you know, minor injuries for which you have also a network of other centers, which could be called as urgent care center, minor injury units, or walk-in centers. And in a catchment area of the NHS Trust, usually you have one a &E department, which is really for life-saving conditions. Uh, and then if, you're, you know, uh, if your treatment requires urgent, but not life-threatening conditions, then you need to be at the urgent care center. Uh, so the first objective of the work is for us to uh, shape demand for urgent care facilities by encouraging patients to, to 
to go to such facilities where they will be seen quicker. They, that might be any department or that could be uh, urgent care uh, center or other centers. Also, we know that there are other types of centers uh, in terms of a &E, uh, terminology, we can say centers, uh, type two centers, which are type two a &E departments. For example, dentists or uh, ophthalmologists, where sometimes people need to be there and they don't need to even be coming to MIUs or a &E department. So the second objective of our work is then to, uh, to, uh, to help patients choose appropriate treatment facilities, which is outside the urgent care network. Having provided you the context, I'm just going to give you the presentation outline. I will start with the motivation of this work. And as I say, it goes back a long way, uh, around 2016. I'll then uh, present the objectives, uh, the uh, solution where I'm going to go through uh, the OR process which we have undertaken, uh, how we have developed the NHS Quicker platform, the, uh, the different networks that we have been connected to and the data set standards. And very important for us is to understand the efficacy of the solution, right? So I'm going to spend some time in terms of the data collection uh, to see whether uh, the solution uh, is working. And, I've, and finally end with acknowledgements. Uh, so this work, uh, uh, started in 2016-17 uh, and the, the case study trust, if I can call it, is based in the Southwest, is the Torbay and South Devon NHS trusts. And here are some of the uh, demographics of the trust uh, that you can you know, read in Devon and Cornwall. Uh, so what we see, and as I explained to you in my, uh, uh, in my opening slide, uh, that in a trust, you have one ED department and the purpose of the ED department is of course for emergency treatment. And the trust in this case, Torby and South Devon at that time also had a total of seven MIUs, right? Located geographically in different parts. Uh, and what we see here through a postcode analysis is that, uh, you know, people who are closer to the ED department, you know, very close to the trust and the trust, uh, and, and this is basically pie chart is showing uh, people from different uh, postcode who are going to this particular, uh, 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 you know, uh, a service center. So those who are located geographically closer to Torbay ED, uh, you see, are, are are being directed there. And if you are further away from from Torbay, let's say Torbay is shown in purple. Uh, then let's say Newton Abbott Center is located somewhere here, and you see then there are more number of people who are coming. So. The ED department at Torbay, you know, uh, it at that time when the analysis was done, was 66 percent of the people were uh, were seen here. So the idea is then for us to uh, to to shape demand, but by trying to uh, send to motivate patients requiring uh, uh, treatment, urgent treatment, but not life-threatening treatment, to other centers. So other than for the patients to be seen quicker, there is also a cost element. So a visit to a &E is more costly than, you know, uh, obviously MIU or a walk-in center. Uh, so if we do a, a, an analysis based on, on the breach, uh, so again, this comes from the Symphony data set. The Symphony is one of the ED systems being used at Torbay and the data is, uh, you know, 2015 and 16. Uh, so at that point in time, uh, Torbay had one emergency department and the red shows the breach rate. So breach rate of the four hour target. As we know, uh, with the NHS, 95% of the patients are expected to be seen, discharged or being you know, sent to some other center of care uh, uh, within the four hour target. So in terms of Torbay ED, the emergency department, 27% you know, a breach. But if you look at the, all the other seven centers, we see the breach rate of the four hour target is you know, less than 1.5%. Now, uh, some work commissioned by Torbay at that point in time showed that 30 to 40% of the people didn't actually need to be in any &E department. Okay, this data is old, but what do we know about the current picture, the national picture? So some data here from February, 2020, and looking at all the 132 trusts, show us that the breach rate over this period of three to four, four years, and you know, considering all the trust is around the same. a &E department still not making targets by 27%. MIUs, which are defined as type three, 
uh, are you know 1.4 percent breach very similar to what we found as well again another bit of work done by nhs digital at 2019 say that nine percent of uh, any attendees are discharged without treatment and a further 32 percent you know, receive guidance only. And if you were to sum up these figures, again, we see uh, a, a value 30 to 40 percent people don't need to be there. Uh, when we look in terms of the frequent users of AE, right, we see that 8 percent of AE patients account for 21 percent of visits. So, is a, a solution possible which, which is, you know, targeted to, let's say, the, you know, frequent uh, AE users? Similar for older any &E, uh, users and you will see uh, that it is about the same thing you know a very small proportion of people are using uh, any &E, uh, a lot more time so by frequent users here what we say is four or more visits in one year so the objective again is as i said before one objective one how do we move patients you know encourage patients to 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 go for treatment to a center for care, which may be actually further away, but they could soon be seen quicker. And second, to encourage them to choose a facility depending on their kind of urgency, which is outside the urgent care network. So GP surgeries, pharmacists, opticians. And uh, I'll tell you the technology that we have done in order to do that. So NHS Quicker app uh, uh, is uh, at the more fundamental level, our USP, the work that has taken the most of the time is to establish link with different NHS uh, uh, you know, trusts in order to make available the real time. Together with the real time, because our objective is to move patients who might be, uh, who are prepared to travel a bit further to be seen quicker. Therefore, what comes into picture is the journey time. So here I see a listing which was taken, uh, you know, uh, uh, some time before, and I'm based in Exeter. My closest hospital is RDNE. In RDNE is only 3.3 miles. But when I open the app, the data is showing me that it is better for me to travel 18.1 kilometers if I've chosen, you know, if I've chosen a car, then it's better for me to travel further because although the journey time is higher, the wait time is much less. Also the number of patients much less. So if I were to go to RDNE, there are more number of patients and there could be more wait time. So uh, this is what we see and uh, uh, it's based in Exeter. And this is what actually happens in most of the centers because by the time you are in the noon or even early morning, the ED departments will overheat. So RDN is an emergency department and Newton Abbott Hospital is MIU. So it is asking me, he's guiding me to go a bit further uh, to be seen quicker. So again, uh, the idea is of nudge economics and we know about uh, you know, Richard Taylor and his work, which won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. And this is what we are trying to implement. How do we nudge patients away? So uh, we are not trying to restrict the choice, okay? The person can go to an a &E, of course, if they want, but the way we are using the travel time combined with real-time data uh, of uh, uh, a &E wait time, we are trying to make certain choices easier for them to accept. And our nudge is very simple. We just order the combined total time based on uh, the, the, uh, the, the lowest at the top. Uh, and there is going to be a nice guideline that's going to come out very soon, October 2020. And I think that NHS Quicker will be one of the first uh, technologies which have uh, used and provided some evidence in the use of nudge. Uh, the second objective, again, as I said, was to encourage people to go to other centers, which are, you know, could be pharmacists, opticians, dentists. And for that, we have worked with the NHS directory of service, with the NHS digital. And this was integrated in the second version of the app. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is, the, the, this confirms to our second objective. Uh, Next, I'm just going quickly through the architecture. We are connected to a lot of centers and I'm going to uh, provide you the evidence of that. Uh, but what we do is that when based on the postcode available, we show only the five uh, places of care, you know, which could be accessed, or could, could, could be accessed using uh, one of which always has to be an ED department, okay? So we are not showing, and again, in order to reduce the cognitive load on the person, rather than you know, displaying you know, 20, 30 centers, we are only showing five centers and there is an algorithm here which will expand until five centers are found. I can go you know, on the, later on if questions about the architecture, but now I'm going to 
follow on. So now, basically, uh, we see that this problem is uh, not specific to the trust. I've shown you some data. So what can we do in order to include this data from multiple trusts? Now, different trusts have got different ED systems. So patient first symphony, they are based on different databases. In order to have one solution, which could be expanded rapidly, we have to first understand the data model. And that brought us to the CDS version 4 ANE emergency data set. So in this data set, again provided by the department, uh, by the NHS Digital, we know, you know, you can see here arrival date, arrival time, patient group. So this basically tells us that irrespective of the ED system a trust is using, you need to report data in a specific format. <coughs> this is telling us the format of the data. Now, once we know the format, we then developed uh, we needed to then engage with different trusts. So it started in August 2016, the first work with uh, Exeter and Torbay, and then we gradually started expanding to Northern Devon Trust, Plymouth, and Royal Cornwall. We developed this health and care impact network, which is basically an informal, uh, you know, uh, uh, informal uh, forum for uh, the, the, the people from the trust, the clinicians, the data people to come in and discuss their problem in terms of their data access analytics to come up with uh, you know, uh, uh, solutions. So this is the original picture of the founders of the uh, of the impact network. So you have Alison Harper from uh, from Exeter, and Susan Martin, and also a clinician Andrew Fordyce. So, and we have this kind of engagement events. Of late, you will see a lot of our projects are now based on ANE departments, right? And ANE wait time. So this started from this workshop on urgent and emergency care. 2017. And since then, you know, students have used this data set that we have got uh, from NHS Quicker. Uh, again, Alison, her PhD, she's using this data set and a recent funding we got from, um, uh, from Queensland, uh, again, uh, implementing a solution uh, similar to a &E. uh, And this was very recent, August 2020. Uh, so NHS Quicker is more than just the app. It has got underlining data standard, again, co-developed through the health and care impact network. It has got a system where you can integrate data feeds and a business intelligence platform. Uh, now I want to talk about the evaluation of NHS Quicker. Because for us, what is important as researcher is, okay, the product is good, but what is the efficacy of evidence of the use of, of real-time data to make urgent choice decisions, right? And for that, we are using an abductive uh, research approach where we are collecting data from multiple sources and trying to see what is the data pointing to. So we are not doing inductive research or we are not doing deductive, but a process of abduction. And I'm going to you know, go through uh, the different <laughs> data sets that we have collected. Uh, some work in progress is with uh, colleagues from our economics department. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so this is work in progress. The first data set I want to present is the questionnaire that was done. Uh, 152 questionnaires, primary data collected from two ED departments and two MIUs. Uh, basically, what do we find from this? I, I don't have the time to go through each of these uh, you know, findings, but we see people who are older in worse health are recommended and recommended to, uh, to, to attend uh, ED are less likely to find this useful. Those who are young, anxious, and who are not sure where they want to go will find our app really useful. Uh, you can see some uh, data here, of course, uh, and I can come to this later. Our second thing is the app analytics backend platform that we are getting. So uh, we have around 30,000 users. Uh, and uh, for example, this is a, a screenshot I took today morning, right, from Google Maps because for the distance calculation. So we have around 2,700 hits per day to the API, which is doing the distance calculation. In terms of unique users, uh, one day yesterday was 325 unique users. In terms of demographic, and again, if we could just cross-reference to what came out of the analysis, we see from our app analytics that yes, it is indeed the case that people who are older, 65 plus, 55 to 64, they are finding this app less useful and not using it that much. But look at 25 to 34 year age range, 35 to 44. And again, process of abductive research, looking at another data source to see what it is pointing to. We then went a step forward and said, okay, let's look at the in-app questionnaire. We developed NHS Quicker version two, including several upgrades. We had a, you know, a feedback system where the users had be maybe able to 
enter directly the feedback based on uh, these questions. We find 82% of them found it helpful and 78% help them decided what to go. So this is the data which was analyzed and you can see the dates very recently analyzed data. And then we are looking at the secondary data analysis and we see that NH is quicker. So there are two different trusts, both of them uh, early adopters. NH is quicker, there has been a shift in demand. How much of that is because of NH is quicker is a question we are trying to understand. But what we see in two different trusts that, okay, the, the percentage change of MIU compared to the previous quarter in the case of Torbay is more yeah, for, uh, uh, for MIUs, but much less in the case of the ED department. Similar, Three figures, minutes. From, similar figures from Torbay and South Devon where we see uh, uh, a change. Uh, so again, as I said, it's been a long project from 2016 onwards uh, and trusts have come in. And this is our connect connectivity. We are connected to eight trusts and we are receiving live feed for 27 centers. And uh, the specific uh, systems that we are connected to are highlighted. The ones in blue are work in progress. With this, I hand over to John Powell, who will be talking about the anecdotal dependence. Over to you, John. You can see on this slide, on the right-hand side, the, 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 the reactions of patients who are one part of this uh, f from an OR point of view, particularly interesting multifaceted system where, as is often the case, you have a physical infrastructure, namely the NHS supply mechanisms, and then you have a psychological system, which is the patients themselves. And I find the, the uh, report on the, on the, right, the top right, where the patient was advised by the GP to drive past the emergency department, uh, which must have been quite shocking, but uh, uh, the patient accepted that they were seen much more quickly despite the, uh, the extra drive. On the left, you see the uh, reaction of the managers of the system themselves, saying it's fantastic that they can see what's happening and, and uh, allowing uh, data in real time to, to allow them to, to, to plan ahead. Next, please. These are the benefits. Firstly, providing information to the public so that they can go to the right place uh, for their condition and at the right time. Supporting the four, H, the four hour standard and future metrics by pushing people towards the MIUs rather than the A&E. Uh, leveraging the data that was already in their systems, there was no extra cost for that. Of course, number four is load spreading and the, the uh, uh, transferability, number five. And then the last point is that this is free to the NHS and, and free to the public because of its support by research funding. Next and last, we'd like to pay uh, our, our tributes to the, the extraordinary support that we've had from, from the, um, uh, the professional experts and the uh, users of, of, of the system. Uh, so many thanks for that and thank you for your attention. Great, thanks very much Navin John. Um, We'll now be switching to our five minutes of questions. Um, so over to the judging panel. Well, thanks very much, Gavin. If I, if I kick off, um, John Hopes, the chair of the, the panel. Um, very interesting project, Nav and John. Thank you very much indeed for sharing that with us. I think there are all sorts of questions that uh, came to mind. One, one, I think, is really just to follow up some of the, um, the thoughts at the end there in terms of the benefits that were delivered. I mean, there's some great anecdotal evidence of, of that the patients and management uh, value the system. Uh, I think there was some, there was some, some compelling evidence also from the, the surveys that, that were done. Uh, I think in terms of the objectives you introduced at the beginning in terms of reducing waiting times, reducing cost, because you showed a big cost differential between the different centers. You know, do you have any evidence of, of that the uh, the system is, is supporting those those benefits? Now, could you take that one? Uh, yes, John. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, if I can go back uh, to this uh, slide, which I didn't have much time to explain. So, the first uh, evidence that we have, which was very done recently, uh, as in you know, as soon after the launch, was from uh, you know Northern Devon NHS Trust. And looking at the data compared to their previous quarter, they said that within three months, uh, uh, there were 9,000 less patients at EDs 
and looking at the tariff calculations which I presented to you earlier, that represented a savings of around 425,000. And that was between December to February. Uh, this particular analysis was, uh, was done by uh, Nick Harrison, who is an analyst at uh, North Devon uh, Foundation Trust. Okay, and, and anything on, I mean, that, that, anything on the, the, you know, how far it's addressing the four hour waiting challenge? Uh, so in terms of uh, how it is, uh, so, so, okay, so, uh, there are different, as I mentioned before, that uh, uh, the reason that we are using an objective research is that uh, the signals are very mixed, right? Because there has been changes to the a &E, uh, wait time and also because of the coronavirus. Uh, so how much of that is because of NHS quicker, we are not 100% sure. And therefore, we are using multiple, uh, you know, multiple uh, types of evaluation in order to capture that. Uh, so if I if I look at the signals that we could, that we are getting from the from the NHS through secondary data, and the and the shift, I cannot claim as a researcher to say all of that is happening because of NHS quicker. But it is not a uh, like a boolean value like zero and one, true or false. Uh, uh, it's if we are able to make a difference of say 10%, uh, that would uh, represent a huge saving in terms of costs and the four hour time. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Susan, if you have a question. Yes, thanks, John. Thanks, Nav and John. That was um, really interesting to, to listen to. Um, just interested in the actual development of the app. So could you say a little bit about maybe the biggest challenge that you, you faced in developing the app and how you sort of overcame that? Uh, yes, so... Uh, uh, no, can, 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 can I start and put, just put a system context and then hand it back to you? Please. Susan, thanks for the question. The, the, what I find particularly interesting in, in this as a, as a, a, a system worker is, is this, uh, the multifaceted side, the fact you've got a physical system which is there, which you can measure, uh, and you've got the psychological system. So, for example, we did a, a big uh, system study where we looked at the effect of patient anxiety now that's a really difficult thing to uh, to measure and quantify, but you can you can see the intimate connection between the two systems uh, when when you start to interrogate it. Here, here's here's the uh, the impenetrable and uh, in indigestible system diagram <laughs> as they all are that we put up, and you can see uh, on on the right hand side there's this th right hand bottom there's anxiety, degree of discomfort patient's perceived urgency. And then on the other hand, you've got uh, on the, the, the left-hand side in the middle, actual waiting times, uh, uh, effectiveness of system management, et cetera. So I think one of the challenges for the, for the app, from my point of view, was, was the uh, make sure that the, both sides of those are interconnected, because it would have been disastrous if we'd taken a frontal approach and just deliberately driven people away from A&E when they needed to go there. Uh, if I can add to the question, from my perspective, in addition to what John said, it is about the technical uh, infrastructure, right? So again, there is no one ED system for all the trusts. So that the names that you see here, Symphony, Patient uh, Care, Track Care, uh, again, they are different systems. And and how do we know what data to, uh, to be captured from there? And for that, we developed the Health and Care Impact Network, uh, which I talked to you about, because that gave us the forum to engage with uh, the, the clinicians, the ED people, the business intelligence, and those who are working on the database in order to actually develop a common standard. And the common standard actually happens to be very simple. This data standard here, a set of fields. Uh, but again, in order to achieve this, right, it is a, it is a cooperative process, co-development with the NHS. But now I can say that any trust in the UK who is able to provide us data in this particular format, the data standard, we are going to integrate and we will be able to provide the nudges because the architecture is already there. So the health okay. and healthcare impact network is our instrument which enabled us to do it. Sorry guys, I'm gonna to have to butt in there. We've run out of time for the uh, questions. Um, we're gonna to have to move on now to our second presenters.
Okay, Stefan and Sri, over to you. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Sri Rao, and um, along with Stefan from Copper Leaf, we will be presenting circuit optimization, um, which has been um, implemented with the National Grid Electricity Transmission. Stefan, could you go to the next slide, please? So, um, I'm I hold the position of plan optimization manager within a National Grid Electricity Transmission. Bit, bit of a background about uh, what National Grid is all about. Um, we own high voltage electricity system across England and Wales. And it's a significant volume of assets that we hold on our network with around 7,000 kilometers of overhead line, 1,500 kilometers of cable, and these are spread across roughly 350 substations. So over last year, we have implemented um, Copper Leaf um, Asset Implement Investment Planning and Management, which will help us enable understand the better solution and also um, the right time of intervention for these assets. Okay, um, so over to you, Stefan. Thanks. Thanks, Sri. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Stefan Sadnitsky, uh, Managing Director for Europe, Middle East and Africa uh, for, for Copper Leaf. Um, Copper Leaf is a global technology company uh, that works with asset intensive businesses such as National Grid uh, to help them understand what interventions or investments on their assets will, will bring the greatest value to their organisation. Essentially asking the question what work to carry out and when. There's, there's lots of great OR within our solutions. Um, we'll talk today around degradation modelling, forecasting and optimisation. Um, we also focus on embedding other techniques uh, such as simulation for uncertainty and machine learning into our products. My, my personal background is in mathematics and operational research. Um, I completed a, a postgraduate certificate in OR from the University of Strathclyde uh, back in 2009 and, and started my career in the, the OR team at Capgemini Consulting. Um, been a member of the OR Society for many years and a bookcase full of jaws and uh, most recently with, with Copley, very pleased to have responded to and completed one of the, the pro bono OR opportunities that was, that was sent out to, to members. For, for the presentation today, uh, Shri is going to start off describing the, um, the problem itself. And I'll then walk through a little bit around the, the solution. And then uh, Shri will finish off um, talking about how we've embedded this within National Grid uh, and some of the benefits that they have achieved. Okay, thank you, Stefan. So, um, so setting the context, as I explained, National Grid owns um, all the high voltage electricity assets across the network between England and Wales. Our investment plans are in the range of 800 million to a billion pounds every year. And what comprises these investment plans? Our assets were installed in late 60s, uh, which means they're pretty much entering into the end of life. Um, and they do need a certain type of intervention, which is either a replacement or refurbishment due to its condition. Some of them do deteriorate whilst they're on the coastal network, faster compared to something that's on an urban network. So that has resulted in a lot more volume of work that needs to be delivered. We also have in the changing energy landscape, we do have new customers who would like to connect to our network by turning into more renewable resources. So connecting these new customers onto our network and potentially modifying the existing network for um, existing customers. That's, that's the other key area that we, um, National Grid, actually invest in. Apart from all of these, once we have all of these assets, as part of any asset management company, we'll have to make sure there is routine maintenance that's carried out as per policy, um, which kind of delivers the three key areas that we need to look at. So what happens in the planning activity? Um, for us to ensure that the actual, um, the work is being delivered, we have critical issues around making sure we deliver the work at the right optimal time, that gives the best benefit, but also need to make sure there is number of people who need to deliver this piece of work are available at the right time which means that to maintain a reliable network, we cannot take the circuit more often. So the diagram on the right just represents the maintenance activities 
on a particular circuit that we need to do, sort of around 10 assets. And each one of them have a different intervention time scales. So depending on the type of assets and when they were installed, they could be on a three year cycle of maintenance or a five year cycle of maintenance, which used to be our old policy on a time based, which means that rather than intervening on a circuit every three years, that's the minimum that you want to do. But actually we were in going ahead and do having to do every other year and doing this bundling manually meant that we weren't getting that full visibility of the future to understand why we actually sending our critical resources to do work every other year rather than doing it as once and once they're there they could actually deliver the whole piece of work so that you don't need to go back onto the circuit for another three years because remember these circuits are something where your demand increases so we need to make sure the reliability of network is maintained so that results in the actual bundling so just to make sure we've got the best um, bundled package of work that's deliverable. Okay, so on the next one, just to show what our electricity um, network looks like. So similar to any transport network, we need to transmit power between point A to point B. So our constraints are more about, we've got the point A and the point B, as you can see in the picture on the diagram, and we've got people on either ends of the circuit. And we do have a bit of a redundancy on a circuit where you've got two circuits that will transmit the power. But at any given point in time, only one circuit can be taken on an outage so that it doesn't restrict power to the other end or making sure that the transmission line is fairly intact. And we do have variances in terms of these are, these are called the boundaries where you want to make sure that the, the power flow is maintained from generation to where the demand is. Um, on top of it, the complexity comes in is we can only take certain circuits out during summer and certain out during winter, which necessarily means you wouldn't be able to get those for the whole 365 days of a year. So we work towards from April to October, which is called as our, um, the timescale when we've got the best availability of the circuit, the summer months. And during winter, there are only a few circuits that you could actually take. So staff and team constraints come in as well because there's different teams are located at different ends of the circuit um, and which necessarily means people would have to travel and we also have critical resources that do take around six to seven years to train to get to that level of qualification and accreditation that they need to do to operate on these high voltage assets. Okay, um, so once that is the smallest problem, as you can see, I mean, when you look at it with just two circuits, this problem gets bigger when you start looking at the network because the circuits span from different places to another place and you could have a new connection coming in at different entities. And this becomes a much more data problem as well as a computational problem to be able to solve manually where, where planners are looking at just a year in advance or even two years in advance of the delivery of work. So, this is a scale of data that we looked at. So we had 60,000 60, assets, um, which each of them, I mean, some of them had 1600 failure modes to go up to. We had to plan different types of interventions and assess which is the right intervention to do on that piece of asset as well. So with these circuits that we've got, um, there's 4 million data points that you come back to. And then you want to make sure that your reliability on the network or the circuit that you take on an outage gives you the best bundling benefit. So constraints that we will need to looking at is we've got 50 teams spread across the country and they've got up to five critical resources that we need to um, consider because there is obviously a demand for those people to make sure that we utilize the team to the time to the maximum when we send them to do a package of work. Okay. Um, Apart from all of these, I mean, we can build the best plan in the world, but also need to consider a consumer interest as well as, is it the best efficient value for the customer that we're delivering? So we're in the heart of that clean, fair and affordable energy. And that's our motto for National Grid. That's our actual purpose and vision. So if to afford, give them an affordable um, kind of a connection to the network, we just need to make sure that our costs are kept to minimum and internally our as we're also a regulated as well as a um, stakeholder funded um, kind of business, we need to make sure that operational costs are put to minimum as well. 
So our risk targets, um, we moved into a risk-based methodology as per our regulator, so which effectively finds out the optimal position to deliver the risk. And Stefan will talk about it when we get to the solution of that. Um, our risk targets could be by critical assets, what we call as the big assets that allow us to keep our network intact. And then uh, the unit replacement targets that we have been setting for individual asset categories. So I'll pass it over to Stefan, who'll talk about the solution design as to how we approached in, or how Copleaf approached in um, jointly resolving this issue. Thanks, Sri. Um, so I'm, I'm going to walk through the, uh, the, the solution uh, we've implemented. Um, and um, as you can appreciate, it isn't a, a trivial problem to solve. Uh, we, we worked collaboratively uh, with National Grid to pick up on the prototypes uh, they've developed over uh, multiple years to, to implement this within our technology solution C55. We split this up into four steps and I'll walk through each of these steps um, in turn. Um, so the first step uh, focuses on individual assets. Um, and uh, this step itself is broken down into multiple stages. Firstly, to, to understand the, the baseline risk for each asset, uh, we consider um, what's the probability of an event um, and what's the consequence of that event. Um, consequences are all monetized, that is converted into pounds and considered across four categories, uh, financial, system, safety and environmental. Each asset can have multiple failure modes um, and the consequence needs to be modeled independently. For example, an electrical transformer could have an end of life, dielectric failure, or could see a mechanical failure on one of its components. So once we understand the, the risk and how this changes over time, um, we want to consider the impact of intervening on the asset. Um, this intervention could be a complete replacement of the whole asset or maintenance or refurbishment of individual components. The red line we have here is the baseline risk, and the green line is the outcome risk following the intervention. We then calculate the delta between these two, um, shown on the bottom chart, um, and then calculate the, the present value um, of, the, um, of the risk that we are mitigating. Once we understand the, the intervention and the value that can bring, we want to understand what's the best time to carry out that intervention. And this is done essentially by evaluating the value at each possible uh, start date of that intervention. The graph, sh the graph here shows for a particular asset, the optimal replacement date um, is in 2028, um, when considering the present value of both the risk mitigated and uh, netted off against the cost. Unfortunately, it doesn't end there as we're, we're interested in the complete um, life cycle costs on, and value for the asset. We therefore take this uh, replacement date um, uh, that we calculated in previous step and then consider multiple life cycle alternatives. We create these with different periodic periodicity and apply policy rules um, such as the maximum time allowed between basic and major maintenance interventions. For example, if we can intervene each year, um, we would um, carry out a major maintenance intervention every six years with a basic maintenance uh, sandwich in between. Um, and for other examples, for example, if we could only intervene every four years, um, we'd be forced to have a major, a major maintenance intervention each every four years. Of course, each of these um, life cycle alternatives has its own uh, cost and value. Um, and this is what we uh, calculate within C55. Um, seeing this kind of sawtooth profile um, as some of the maintenance interventions do not uh, mitigate the, the risk completely. That is step one, uh, and essentially we've calculated multiple life cycle strategies for each stage. Steps two and three are preparatory steps uh, for the full network optimization, so I'll, I'll run through those quickly. Um, step two uh, generates multiple bundling uh, candidates um, for each circuit. So now we're considering not just the individual assets uh, in isolation, but the role they play within a circuit. And what we want to do is um, consider um, or have develop multiple candidates uh, for how we can bundle uh, these, uh, these circuits. I've got a simple example here with just three assets, but in reality, um, 
um, national grid will have over 60 assets in each individual circuit. And we do this by optimizing with different cost of outage um, to trigger more or less bundling by the optimization uh, to come up with multiple candidates. Five minutes. Um, we then look at the regions and as that's an important input into the, uh, the final step. So the final step is the network-wide optimization. Um, Sri has um, detailed the complexity, the, the number of constraints that we're looking um, to, to consider. Um, and essentially we've got a, a fairly complex um, mixed integer linear algorithm program uh, that's embedded within our solutions. Essentially we're looking to, to maximize the, um, the value um, across the different networks um, um, to select the, the right interventions at the right time. Unfortunately for this audience, um, I, I don't think I need to uh, walk through the inner details of um, uh, uh, the Millfield algorithms. So just to finish off, um, here's a visual view of a circuit pre-bundling, um, and then we can see the effect that the, the bundling has on that, uh, on that circuit. And what we see is that we've managed to carry out more interventions, mitigated more risk, um, and done so um, while just reducing the outage requirements across the network. So with that, I'll, I'll hand back to uh, Shri, uh, quickly talk about embedding the solution, um, and then finally the, uh, the benefits uh, within National Grid. Thank you, Stefan. So whilst we have to embed the solution with anything that um, we deliver as a transformation project, there will be four areas to consider, people, process, systems, and data. This, as you can see, that this particular product is very data heavy and it touched upon multiple areas that we had to um, actually reflect back within the business itself. And the key areas that you can see is people who look after the assets and their life cycle, um, people who build in the investment plans and also people outside of the delivery. So the project actually spanned for nine months um, and we delivered the project successfully last September. So just give skipping through the couple of slides that was there um, in terms of um, embedding across the systems. We've got complex systems and the teams that we've got. I'll move on to the benefits. Um, so the key benefit for this was we ensure there is a good bundled package of work that can be delivered, right? So what we have realized so far is the centralized platform. There is a slide that showed about the multiple systems that interface and the data transfers that happen. So the data transfers happen overnight, once a month, depending on the complexity of data. So we've got eight data transfers. It's a fully integrated package of work. I've been with National Grid for 12 years and I haven't been able to just get into one system where I can look at the information and this provides me that. So it becomes a centralized platform. Um, planning efficiency. Um, so last year's plans, when we built it, it took 50% um, less time to actually deliver. Um, build the plan and package it work and deliver it. So if we pass, go on to the next one in terms of the more tangible benefits um, that we have actually delivered as part of the tool. Um, Stefan, do you want to move on to that? So um, for the next year's plan, um, up until now, our average bundling was around 4.4, which means that for every single outage, you would get up to four packages of work delivered within that. But now it's gone up to seven so which necessarily means that we are um, for the number of outages has actually reduced by a thousand for the same package of work that we would have delivered in the past which gives us roughly this is just a back-end time um, taken on the money spent which is like six million pounds um, a year um, because it's around 6k for each outage that we spend so moving on to the next um, slide um, also want to just focus on this was meant to be, I mean, our planning takes around nine to 10 months before the delivery year, but COVID actually, actually taught us to plan it at a more agile timescale. So we had to deconstruct that whole plan that had taken us up to 12 months to build. And what the C55 circuit optimization allowed us to do was make sure we plan, um, you know, just rebundle the whole thing and deliver the package, but also consider all of the constraints and multiple scenarios, which we haven't been able to do in the past manually. We could only come up with one scenario by taking up to six months to build it. But now multiple scenarios, depending on where the strategy of the business is going, whether we can afford to build 
deliver those work? Can we keep our people safe during these pandemic times? Can we also make sure what happens in the supply chain whilst that work needs to be delivered? So 30 seconds. Yeah. So considering all of this, um, we built a plan. Um, actually, we built three plans and we executed one of them that made us um, deliver most of the work. And so we've been out in the field since March, still delivering the work as planned, apart from a two week pause that we had originally. So um, something like this that hasn't been able to be done in the past has allowed us to prioritize the work, go and deliver where the risk benefit needs to be maximum. So um, just the last slide to just show about um, what our um, electricity transmission um, director, um, David Ride, had to comment about it. So we can manage and we can anticipate our asset um, deterioration in the in early stage. We can put an intervention in its place and we can help the consumers and our um, stakeholders to make sure that they have done the right investment. Okay, that takes us to the end of the presentation. Um, any questions? Please. Great, thank you, Sri. Let's hand over to the judging panel. Thanks, Gavin. Um, perhaps this time, Susan, you'd like to go first? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, thanks, Stefan and Sri. Um, it's obviously a, a massive task that you had to undertake there. So it's really interesting to hear about. Um, I'm obviously, National Grid has been scheduling maintenance for many, many years prior to this solution. Um, could you just say a little bit exactly about what the key novelty of this solution is compared to both what was done prior and maybe what other people around the world are doing? Okay, um, so yes, absolutely right, um, Susan. We have been maintaining our assets because we've been owning them for a long time. So um, like I said, our maintenance policies um, around 1990s when we designed the real maintenance policies, we had um, like a cyclic duration for the maintenance and depending on the type of assets as and when we got the condition data we got a bit better about understanding the condition and knowing you can actually move things to the right or move things to the left depending on whether you can afford to take that risk on the network um, unfortunately we didn't have a platform that would tell us actually is this okay to not deliver in the current year rather than moving into next year and um, allowing people to make those decisions at the right time, um, because that's, that's the key thing about the tool. Because um, somebody who is actually planning will just think, I need to plan this piece of work because it tells me to do, but actually if I give a risk figure, pound risk figure against it, I can afford to move it to next year because overall on the network, I know we can get up to this particular risk figure. And that's, that's the thing about the constraints and looking at a um, national level rather than planning in terms of zonal and team level which is more um, siloed approach of um, delivering that work. Okay thank you. Alan do you want to uh, ask a question? Yes thank you thanks so uh, Alan Robinson yeah very interesting presentation. Um, I'm interested in how the hard data and what I would call the softer data interact because a lot of this data presumably has to be extracted from experts who know how long things take or how likely they are to fail. Can you say a little bit about how you, how, how you make sure that soft data get, got captured and validated as part of the process? Um, yes, so um, we've got three sets of data that come in. Like I said, there is asset condition, um, which the asset life cycle team actually um, look after. Um, so that's captured at a site level. So we do have a condition data platform. Um, and on an annual basis, we do look at the condition, has the asset deteriorated or it's actually pretty much the same based on our uh, previous expectations. And that's where the failure modes kick in. So we record the failure mode for the asset, has a family of this particular asset type deteriorated. Um, and then it kind of gives that broader thing about, do we need to alter the time for intervention or the risk at that for that particular um, the asset family itself and that happens once a month and that data is captured um, outside of the tool but it's fed into the tool to build the optimization platform so once the condition data is captured this whole analysis has um, taken place to understand what's the actual equivalent age of an asset or what type of an equivalent type of um, maintenance activity that you need to perform so data is fed in um, once a month for these type of um, 
condition data sets into the tool which is integrated and the, the other data that we feed in is also the asset data itself um, on a day-to-day -day basis because new assets come in and the old assets will be removed um, investment data is once a month and um, so they're the three sets of data that go in um, to the tool. Thanks and a related quick one how, how did you take those people providing those data with you on the journey so they believed and were happy to follow the schedules when you when you derived them? Okay um, so the project delivery itself we did a prototype before uh, we engaged to the external supply market so the prototype or kind of suggested the, uh, or actually showed the gains back to the business, um, so which demonstrated the gains internally, which allowed us to actually work with Copperleaf to design this off the shelf solution. Um, so with any project, data becomes a key priority. Um, so working with them and demonstrating the be benefits, um, sorry, I had to run through one of the slides where it was a phased kind of a delivery. So taking different teams, across those approaches so we could focus on the team that provides us that information. And it was in um, a three month slot for them so that we know we're focusing fully on them to understand the data capture as well as taking them through to implementation, which meant we weren't actually kind of, so we, because we were a small team and we have to do this as part of um, a reorganization as well. So the company had come through a long way um, during that time. So making sure that it was done in pockets enabled people to understand what does it actually mean to them and how can they contribute um, and take that they actually kind of bought into this. And now that it's integrated, there is nothing, there's no manual intervention for them to go in every day and check what's happening that, because the tool's integrated across the systems. This enables them to right, you know, just go into the end and see, yeah, has that actually worked? Or do I need to run more scenarios to understand um, where the asset um, data actually comes from or what's happened over the last month on our network? So that gives them the platform to um, realize it. Okay, so, uh, sorry. John, sorry, John, John any time panel. left? Sorry, no, no time, I'm afraid, uh, John. Um, okay. So if we, we can switch to our third presenter, Jordan. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I, ah, there we go. I was going to say, I can't share my screen. There we go. Thank you, Stefan. Okay, so, uh, so my name is Jordan. Um, I'm from a, a small team of analysts within the Department of Transport that we call the Analytics Unit. Um, this is going to be an overview of the work that we've been doing on, on mobility, really, for the past six months during the coronavirus outbreak. So a bit of a background first, um, during the past six months, obviously all will be very aware of the restrictions in movement that have been put in place. Um, whenever decisions like this are made, going to be made, um, naturally the government wants to monitor them, um, understand the impact that they're having and, and use that to inform their decisions. That's where we come in. But the problem in this case um, is that the Department for Transport hasn't previously ever had a national mobility metric. Um, everything's been specific to single transport modes, such as rail, cars, buses, as you can see on the left there, um, or done in, in slower time using national surveys um, and uh, methods such as that. Um, there, there's also no, or, or there wasn't, any uh, appropriate measure for some of the other ways we might get around walking, cycling, uh, the active travel, um, but which became really important when we're, we're not making these longer journeys and we're only making smaller journeys. Um, so this means that we, um, as a department, as an analytics unit, uh, were forced to adapt to use uh, what we would consider innovative data sources, um, not previously used across government. Um, I'm sure you can probably guess from the images there um, that they were mobile telecoms providers. Um, we did do an initial scan of other you know, openly available sources, Google, Apple, um, a variety of companies were providing data online freely. Um, but for, for reasons you know, such as representativeness, um, active users versus passive users, um, we ended up moving away from these and instead used them um, in conjunction with this mobile tele for telecoms data um, for validation for additional kind of bits of background. Um, so here I'm going to talk primarily about the work we did with the mobile telecoms um, and that for us is a, is a kind of a, a novel source. So to put it all in context, 
obviously you'll be aware earlier this year coronavirus hit the UK sometime later the UK goes into a lockdown um, 23rd of March was a Monday that same day um, our team pivoted from uh, projects that we were working on elsewhere um, to entire look at this problem and within 24 hours we had uh, initial insights that we were delivering uh, across government really uh, within 48 hours as you can see there kind of even to the NHS devolved administrations um, and the, the CCS civil contingencies secretariat um, by the end of that week um, we had a, a daily process fully operational um, which as you'll see later in the presentation um, was turning out around 32 um, analytical products um, in about one to two hours um, which I hope is, is quite impressive um, so we spent the next three months that process clearly is very labor intensive we spent the next three months refining it um, automating it to some extent um, and as you'll see along the bottom there um, learning from what works uh, to essentially target the key messages um, get those decisions made uh, and get the information where it needs to be uh, much more accurately but while we're doing that the new analytics didn't stop um, We've still we looked at uh, what level of mobility is expected in lockdown. I'll cover all these in more detail in, in future slides, but what level of mobility is expected? Um, things like these new uh, metrics, breaking out the modes of travel, things that, that hadn't been used before, and a number of other things, um, some examples there, cross-border flows um, and some of the major cities. Um, and then as the UK lockdown came to an end, some of these local lockdowns, you'll see an example of Leicester there, came into play um, and our analysis, the focus started to shift towards these, towards more local decision makers, um, but the timelines critically about the same, still about one to two days for each of these, these turnarounds and daily packs being produced. Um, what was useful here, um, le we learned lessons from Leicester that we could then apply to future packs and I'm sure they'll, they'll still continue towards the end of the year. But now we've had seen another shift towards, uh, as was alluded to earlier, looking at the, uh, the return of schools um, and what impact they have on mobility. And one last point to make is that we are still providing this now. Uh, shortly after this presentation, I'll be off to, to provide another daily pack. So a bit of an overview of what's been provided. That's the timeline. What did we actually give? Um, I caught, talk, talked about daily mobility updates. Um, this is the general um, bringing in lots of data using lots of analytical techniques to inform the kind of the real-time decision making. A bit of predictive analytics, um, so how well are we doing against targets and um, can we inform any future decisions coming up. Some of the local work, um, so uh, a smaller scale, smaller level, different data sets and different links. Um, and then some of the, the novel uh, new metrics that are still being used by the department now um, and even taking on more widely. So I'm going to cover each of these in a bit more detail um, over the next five or so minutes. Okay, so daily mobility updates. This is where initially uh, the bulk of our effort was focused. Um, seeks to answer a really wide range of questions. I've, I've jotted a couple down in the top right, but really any question that could potentially inform the UK's decision making, the government's knowledge of what's going on within the UK um, to help them decide when to release the lockdown, when to um, enforce more restrictions uh, and so on and so forth. Um, any of that really comes into our, our daily mobility updates, uh, which were being done in real time. So, I mean, because of the variety here, um, it really uses kind of multiple te techniques, multiple data sources um, alongside that mobile telecom. So we were bringing in um, some ONS data, uh, sorry, Office of National Statistics data um, to uh, supplement uh, the, the local authorities so we could look at demographics, as you'll see in the, the bottom left there, um, which really showed that in the initial stages of the, uh, the outbreak and the lockdown, um, certainly the, the elderly population were following the restrictions much more closely um, and then the younger generations, I don't know if you can quite make it out, it's the bottom two charts on the left there, um, followed shortly after. Um, so that shift was really interesting in forming um, some of the uh, restrictions that followed after the initial advice. Um, all of this uh, being done in about a one to two hour window between the, uh, the data arriving typically midday um, and UK you know, decisions being made mid-afternoon um, these analytical packs being sent out 
um, across government really. So automation of this was was really important and that's where a lot of our effort focused. Uh, as you can see they're used across across DFT, Scottish Government, uh, Welsh Government and we've had uh, recent feedback from Wales to say that it's been used in their, their equivalent of the, um, the SAGE um, which is the, the scientific advisory group to, to the government there. So moving on from the daily mobility updates, some of the predictive stuff that we've done. Um, here, focusing on what level of trips do we expect? So this is something we did initially um, in around, around March, as you'll have seen on the timeline, uh, looking at if only key workers were to travel, um, what sort of trips do we expect? We can then use that, of course, to look at um, local authorities and regions in the UK where we're seeing more trips than expected um, and ask ourselves why that might be happening, if there's anything we can do um, and use that as a, a possible um, flag for future outbreaks. Um, so that's really the, the motivation behind this. Um, the challenge was combining you know, multiple data sources, multiple population statistics. Um, each data source we bring in is valid for a different geography, different region of the UK. Um, so I suppose it's sort of a similar challenge to the to the NHS presentation um, in that we had a lot of different feeds coming in and we had to try and combine all that somehow um, and segment it in a number of different ways so that we could individually predict the behavior of segments of society. Um, what's really exciting here is that's then been, that was then taken on um, by another team in the department. It's still being used now and they used some of this work to inform uh, when and how uh, lifting of the restrictions should take place and in what order uh, different groups of, of government and different workers um, should return to work. So that was really exciting. So moving on to some of the local work, this is again just one example of a, a multitude of things we looked at. Um, this is looking more, more at where people move to from individual authorities um, and how that varies over time. So sometimes this was requested by local authorities. Um, it started off internally as a bit of an initi initiative that we thought would be useful. Um, you can see here we've produced a couple of choropleth maps, um, some nice pretty videos on the bottom that turned out to be really useful in demonstrating um, lockdown fatigue um, as over, over time people began to um, return to, to movement, return to shops, return to work um, before restrictions had necessarily been lifted. Uh, this really demonstrated kind of, you know, as you can see there, I won't read it off the slide, where people um, were traveling to. It gave a really good insight into where um, the next outbreaks might be. Um, and it was used by, uh, in this particular example, the London region, you'll see there, uh, East Midlands, top left, and, and Leicester, top right. Um, but it's been used repeatedly, um, and we've repeated this analysis a number of times for, for each of the different local outbreaks. And finally, then, uh, some of these, these novel techniques that I talked about, novel uh, metrics that I talked about earlier. Um, the department hadn't previously had any uh, measure of walking and cycling and certainly nothing that was that was real time. Um, but given the number 10 priority uh, earlier this year um, and the focus on clearly shorter trips, there's lots of nice weather. I'm sure many of you will have gone out and enjoyed that um, either by walking, either by cycling. It's really important to capture that uh, and what's going on to inform these decisions about lockdown mobility and to understand how the population is moving um, so we can potentially predict how the, the virus is going to spread. Um, this here is just a first step. Um, we expect it will evolve over time. Um, you can see on the slides there, it's already been used in the national cycling strategy. Um, it just breaks out walking and cycling um, and the change since uh, February. Uh, so ongoing at the moment, we have started to look at bringing in weather um, and other data sources to try and look at what level above the predicted um, that we might have, have seen during the outbreak. Um, but certainly this was really uh, critical in a number of uh, tweets you may have seen from, from ministers um, and informing some of the, the government's decisions and, and policy around um, constructing cycle paths um, and informing the, the lockdown. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier with some of the other bits of work, this has been taken on further. Um, there's now a new team being set up within the department to take this on 
Um, so that's certainly really exciting for us and we'll be uh, monitoring this, taking the data further, something that was initially a novel data source um, to be able to take this on and, and have a, a new team set up, um, I, I consider a success. To summarise then, um, I won't read out everything that's on this slide and perhaps instead I'll say that um, this experience, it's been a really, really rapid pace. Um, so for someone in, in my perspective, uh, being able to kind of inform the government uh, daily during a national emergency, um, it's been hard work, it's been rapid and it's been demanding, um, but it's been really in exciting. Um, and the, the fact that you can see the decisions being made in real time, the, the top right there um, is a, a screenshot of a BBC uh, news presentation that was given uh, back in, I think the date's probably on there, I can't, I can't remember exactly, June. Um, uh, so, so being able to see that in real time is really exciting. Um, and the whole of government, um, for me, the, the, the impact there, the whole of government is now using uh, or investing in this telecoms data. Um, so if that's not uh, enough proof that you, know, you can use novel data sources and make them work, um, then that's certainly uh, enough for me. Uh, so I've covered off the lasting impact there. Um, I just, just mentioned on that last point, um, because of the timescales, we, we did uh, not struggle, but we did have to adapt our QA processes. Um, and make sure that all of the, uh, what, am I, what am I wanting to say, the analysis um, was robust, was evidenced uh, before we sent it to the ministers. So trying to incorporate that into the one, two hours, um, I have to say was, was a challenge, but one that we overcame, um, especially so virtually. So with that, I think I finished a little bit ahead of time, apologies. Um, are there any questions therefore from the panel and perhaps we'll have time for, for others elsewhere. Thanks, Jordan. So it's, um, um, over to the panel. Yeah, Alan, do you want to go first this time? Yeah, shall I kick off? Thanks, Jordan, for a fascinating and very fast pace piece, piece of analysis. Um, you've answered one that you might expect somebody like me to ask already about quality assurance, but how, how, how do you get inside that sort of uh, loop in terms of putting stuff in front of very senior people, but making sure you're happy with the quality of the work that, that, that you're taking forward? So I think I'd probably summarise that by saying we broke it up. The, the QA process, I mean a traditional quality assurance process would, would work its way up through a number of different people. You'd have the peer review, clearly you'd have the, the more senior review. Um, so I think by breaking it up into those separate steps that that means you can bring the timescales down much quicker. So sometimes it was done in parallel. A lot of the time, um, I mean, you can see the, the size of the team there. One person would do uh, a bit of analysis and then you can get the rest of the team or someone in the rest of the team to uh, make sure that your calculations are correct while someone else um, is checking that the presentation conveys the key messages. Um, and then it can go through uh, more senior leadership before it goes to the ministers um, and that almost doing it in parallel um, really brings the timescales down. And actually, I have to say that by working virtually, um, in some sense, that has made all of this quicker um, because getting, getting in touch with people um, and, you know, as you can see, everyone's in one place there um, much more easily than it would be in physically. Thanks, Jordan. And, and one other quick one from me. In terms of the future of the tool, and you touched on it, we, this has all happened during fairly clement weather. Um, <laughs> How, how, how do you future-proof and this sort of tool for, for what might be coming next? So that's certainly something we've been looking at. Um, our baselines at the moment, we're all looking at changes since March. Um, it doesn't affect most modes of transport as much as you think it might. Um, so road and, and rail travel certainly isn't affected so much by weather. Um, I mentioned it mostly under the cycling and walking. Um, and we've been looking, although we haven't finished that yet, I'd love to be able to, to give you an answer, but we'll, we'll come back on that one. Um, looking at kind of using previous years of data uh, and going further back in time to see how the seasonality in people's behavior changes under years where there hasn't been a major outbreak. Um, and so far, or, you know, our initial thoughts so are that actually what we're seeing is there was a bit of a spike um, above what you'd expect normally during the outbreak as people were at home, people are using their bikes more. Um, but possibly that it's come down within normal levels now. Although, you know, this is all initial analysis and uh, I'd love to be able to give you an answer, but that's sort of how we're looking at doing it. 
the uh, the new cycling team, I'm sure, will give you more information on that. Are you done, Alan? Yeah, I think he is. Uh, Jordan, yeah, I had a question for you. you. Obviously, there's an enormous amount of information that is now available that wasn't available before. It's all being put together really rapidly. Uh, and as you've said several times during the presentation, to, it, it, it supports improved decision making. But I'd just like you to be a bit more specific about that. Um, what, what, what would you say were the big decisions that have been made using this information that couldn't have been made otherwise? Just give a few examples. So some of the decisions around uh, local lockdowns, um, I'd be hesitant to say too much here, um, but some of the decisions around local lockdowns, certainly looking at areas that are connected, um, as we did with the, the chlor chloropleths, um, has enabled us to provide the local decision makers with a kind of early insight into whether or not they might need to take more action. Um, and I think one of the, the key uh, impacts, I suppose, is the, the inclusion of our, our cycling and walking series in the, the national uh, cycling strategy. So uh, the fact that we've, we've seen an increase and the fact that we're able to monitor that is now feeding into um, the provision of more cycle lanes and some guidance uh, across government on how to um, use uh, planners and, and cycling. Um, I think those for me are the biggest impacts. We've also seen some impacts um, around the, the release of the lockdown. Um, and as I mentioned, the lockdown fatigue, we looked at one point across uh, comparing different countries um, and we were able to say, you know, from our predictive analytics that we'd reached what we would consider a minimum. We're not going to go any lower than this, um, but we also expect it to go back up as it has in some other countries. And, and we saw that a few weeks later, but the government were well prepared. Um, as with any government work, clearly it's difficult to, to say that all of this is due to our input. Um, there are a lot of other departments, you know, the NHS particularly, um, who've been feeding into this. So. Okay, no, thank you for that. Uh, Susan. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks, Jordan. That was a really good um, presentation. I just want to pick up on that last slide, was particularly with respect to the novel content. And, you know, you, you touch upon the metrics there that you believe are novel. Now, obviously, as you say there, all these were created just within a few days. So, and it was a very, obviously, fast paced, fast paced. But have you had time to reflect on that novelty of creating these measures and whether or not with more, more, more time allowed, you would use the same measures, adapt these measures, change them? And if so, how would that impact going forward? Yeah, ab absolutely. You're, you're right. They were created very quickly. Um, it's the best solution we had available at the time. Um, I think looking back, with what we had at the time, I certainly wouldn't change anything. Um, but as, as time has gone on, um, they're not uh, the most robust measures. And that's, that's where this cycling team in that particular case comes in. Um, they're looking now at uh, how do we adapt other feeds that we might have coming into the department and combine it with this mobile telecom to create an even kind of more robust measure. Um, the, the success there, clearly other government departments using mobile telecoms, we've proven that it can be used in a robust uh, robust manner. Um, does that answer your question? I feel like I kind of yeah, went yeah, off topic. Yeah. Uh, just, yeah. just a quick one. Let's say we're all, we all close our eyes and we fast forward and hopefully at one point we're all post COVID. You never know. Um, how, what do you see the big usages for this if, if COVID was behind us? Uh, so, I, I expect there will be other situations like this. Um, I imagine it will be used more to influence uh, other, go other government decisions. So I mentioned the national cycling strategy. There are equivalents for all the other, the other modes. How do we use our cars? How do we use our buses? Um, in the past, everything's been done through this, I think it's twice a year, possibly once a year, national travel survey. Um, and so this, this really gives that real time um, analysis of the impact of decisions. So I think I envisage this being used in, you know, we're looking at making this decision, um, how do we think it will impact the data? And then after the decision's been made, we can really look at a, a daily cycling, daily road use series um, and see how that's been used there. Uh, so that's where I see it being used, but clearly at the moment it's, it's kind of just, here's the information, um, here's how it might inform your decisions. Okay. okay. 
thanks guys. I'm gonna draw that questioning to a halt. We have got a little bit of time and we've had one question for Jordan uh, from the floor. So I'll relay that now uh, from Ibrahim. Have you investigated the correlation between the population mobility and the number of cases in a region? Yes, so I mean in short, yes, we absolutely looked at that um, right back at the start. Um, the ON Office for National Statistics took more of it on than we did, so we ended up passing it over to them. But the, the challenges we had there were really around the, the timeline um, of the, the virus. So often you'll see a delay between population mobility and um, a virus outbreak in that area. Um, and really narrowing down that delay, the, the 14 days, 10 days, you know, even up to a month, um, and trying to improve that correlation. We did get it up to about you know, 0.8 at one point. Um, I, I, that's, that's the real challenge there, but we've passed it on now to other government departments. So. Great, uh, thanks very much for, for answering that. Um, right, so um, I'll try and draw this session to a close. I'd like to thank um, all three of our uh, presenting teams, all three um, excellent presentations and very, very, very interesting. Uh, thanks too to our judging panel. The judging panel are, are heading off to another Zoom meeting to uh, make their deliberations. Um, one thing that we'd like to feed into that is uh, you, the audience, your vote on who you think uh, provided the best presentation. So if I could ask Geraldine to launch that poll. Some of you um, looking at this on browsers may or may not be able to see that. Um, so yes, if you'd like to vote, we'll give a little bit of time for you to do so. We're not planning to share this with you uh, at the moment, but we will feed it into the judges. So we'll give that uh, a little more time. Please get those votes coming in. Okay, how are we doing on that, Geraldine? I can't see progress. If you want to capture the result, Geraldine, uh, then you can close it down when you think you're ready. So while you're doing that, uh, let me just give you a heads up of what's happening next. Uh, from this session, we head into uh, a short break. Uh, the next session starts at one o'clock and we have a, a plenary speaker, Ellen uh, Lewis, uh, joining from the States. And she's talking about inclusive systemic evaluation, uh, deepening understandings of engagement and community. Um, uh, she'll be on for an hour and after that we have an even shorter break, just 15 minutes and quarter past two we start into the uh, next group of, of parallel sessions uh, and then we finish the day off uh, with a bit of virtual networking uh, at quarter past three. Okay, good, we've uh, got that in. Um, so I'll, um, sorry, one more announcement to make. Um, just had an email through our internal systems that all of the videos from yesterday's sessions should now be available. So if you uh, want to go back to look at any of those through the app, you can now do so. Uh, great news and good work from the team on that one. Okay, so I'll uh, thank you all for your uh, involvement in this session. Thanks for coming to view it. Thanks for the presenters and thanks for the judges. The winner will be announced as part of the closing session uh, tomorrow afternoon, which takes place after the final plenary at about quarter past three. So hope you'll all be uh, tuning in, uh, eager to find out what uh, has happened. Okay, thanks very much for your participation. Cheerio.